And at this time, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read the Christmas story. If you have a phone or an app or a Bible, how about a Bible? Paper Bible. The book of the law. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in a swaddling cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds, living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to us, to you this day, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for this moment to celebrate your son, Jesus Christ. Your word says his name is called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father. Father God, today there are people here today that need a touch from the Lord Jesus Christ, a personal, intimate encounter with Christ during this service. And Father God, we know that the Spirit of Christ will be here today. And Father God, I just pray that every man, woman, and child in this building will open their hearts to receive this wonderful gift of Jesus Christ. If you've been struggling with worry or fear or anxiety or addiction or anything that's stopping you from feeling free, then Christ is here to set you free during this service. Father God, we just praise you for what you're doing. We praise you for the lives that are represented here. We thank you for the service that's about to begin. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stand together. We're going to sing a bunch of Christmas carols tonight. You ready?
must have really been something. You know the story? Two kingdoms went to war over her. Thousands of men gave up their lives so that one man might have her. Hers was the face that launched a thousand ships. Helen was the wife of Menelaus, king of Greece in the ninth century BC. Their home was a peaceful Mediterranean kingdom until the arrival of Paris, Prince of Troy. Now Paris, he fell in love with Helen. And depending on the version of the story you know, she fell in love with him. And under the cover of night, Paris stole her. And took her back to Troy with him. And that was the beginning of the Trojan War. Menelaus and his brother Agamemnon they amassed a mighty Greek army and set off in 1,000 ships to lay siege to Troy, all to win Helen back. I think few people have ever felt so pursued and wanted as Helen. Sometimes we wonder if we've ever been noticed. When you were a kid, maybe dad was too busy to come to your games or your recitals. Perhaps mom was too busy in her ending, never-ending pile of housework or her own career. Maybe one of the parents jumped ship altogether. You know, we come into the world longing to be special to somebody, but often from the start, many of us are disappointed. And rare are the people who have been sought after for who they are, not because of what they can do or what others can get from them. And we too, like Helen, we were stolen from our true love. Most human beings have no idea about this story. And our true love launched the greatest campaign in history to get us back. You know, God created us for intimacy with him. And when we turned our back on him, he promised he'd come for us. He sent a bunch of messengers over the years, over centuries. He did. And then uh, when all else failed, he conceived the most daring of plans. Under the cover of night, he stole into the enemy's camp incognito. The Ancient of Days, disguised as a newborn. It's a great disguise. It's a good idea. What threat would a baby be anyway? And what is it that God sees in us that causes him to act as the jealous lover? Read the Bible. You'll get that idea. What causes him to lay siege on the kingdom of darkness and on our own idols the things that we go after instead of God. And he's trying to win us once again for himself, willing literally to move heaven and earth. And what is it exactly that he wants from us? You know, we've been offered many explanations. From one religious camp, we're told that God wants obedience. He wants sacrifice. He wants adherence to the right doctrines. He wants us to be moral. The more therapeutic churches suggest that, no, God is after our contentment, our happiness, even our wealth. Well, he's perhaps concerned about all these things, but that's not his primary concern. Do you know what God wants? Relationship. 
<laughs> okay. What he is after is us. Our laughter, our tears, our dreams, our fears, our hearts. Isn't that your primary concern when trying to win somebody you love? It's what you saw in that person. It's something about the way they laughed, the way they smiled, the way they simply saw life, the way they lived life. It's their dreams, their tears, everything. And with reckless abandon, shoving all conventions aside with full intention, willing to move heaven and earth if it was possible, you went after that person for who the person was in their heart, their heart of hearts. Our hearts are what he wants. Does this sound kind of icky sweet? Kind of sloppy, especially to the guys? Yeah. What kind of message is this? It's different. The series I'm doing this month is different. And if you haven't heard the first two, I'd encourage you to go online to our website and listen to catch up to speed to where we're going. But we're looking at, a, at the Christmas season through some different lenses. Instead of looking at the, at the characters that usually show up, the Mary and the Joseph and who are the wise men and what's the shepherd's roles and the locations, Bethlehem and Egypt and Nazareth, these places associated with the Christmas story, King Herod, we're looking at something else. Our hearts are really what he wants. If you're familiar with the uh, prophet Isaiah, in the 29th chapter, verse 13, it's where he records God saying, you know, these people that are supposed to be mine, who I love to death, and I've done a whole lot for over their lives and over generations, you know, they give me all this stuff, all this religious stuff, all this, um, you know, spiritual treadmill stuff, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus said the exact same thing. Well, of course he would because he is God. It's in Matthew 15 he says it. He says these people's hearts are far from me. And I'm right here. I couldn't get nearer to them and still they're far from me. You know, God closed the gap when he came to earth in the person of Jesus. In the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking, and to one church in particular, one group of Christians, he says, I have this against you. You have abandoned your, your first love. You've abandoned me. You know, how few of us actually believe this? We've never been wanted for our heart, our truest self, not really, not for long. I mean... Have you ever had somebody that you really admire talk to you about their friendship with you in a way that caused you to say to yourself, why would he or she want to be friends with me? What in the world could he or she possibly see in me? Because we just don't think there's really anything desirable in us. And so we desperately want to be desired and pursued. But when we are by the God of the universe, we run. I think if we're honest with ourselves, um, there's a lot in us we just, we don't like. And, uh, and we think that because we see ourselves a certain way, that's the way that we should be seen. That that's the truth about who we are. But actually, you don't really know the truth about who you are and your own worth until you actually hear from the one that made you. Who's pursuing you? Who says what you're worth and why you're worth pursuing? Now, some of us, maybe we got a big ego. Some of us are narcissists, and maybe we think we're, we're pretty good. Okay? And of course God would like me. Of course he'd come after me. Let me say this. Despite your ego and your, and your narcissism, you're wrong. Because he, he likes you a lot more than you like you. He sees a lot more in you, even you who have a hyper view of yourself.
But for most of us, when we pass a stranger on the street, you know, you avert eyes. How about when you go into an elevator? There could be a whole bunch of you in an elevator, and what happens? Most people, you just kind of, you know, you're looking for anything to look at instead of each other. For 30 seconds, even on the elevator, it's just dead quiet. Um, John Eldridge, author, he writes, In some deep place within us, we remember what we were meant to be. We carry with us the memory of being image bearers, the image of God walking in the garden back in the days of Adam and Eve. But why do we flee our essence, this reflection of God on the planet Earth? And as hard as it may be for us to see our sinful nature, it's harder for us still to remember our glory. Something I talked about last Sunday. And I'll add, it's because we've never, you and I, we've never had it. We never experienced it. Adam and Eve, when they first sinned, we call it in the scriptures, and we, we talk about it in church, we call it the fall of humankind. Well, to fall means, well, you were a higher place at one point, and they fell from an incredible height. Well, you and I, we don't know what it was like to be at that place where Adam and Eve fell from. All we know is we were born, which we didn't choose to do. We were also born sinful with this bent to be self-centered. That wasn't our choice. You just have it. You're infected with it. Bible calls it sin. That's how it's explained. And it's passed into our DNA, you might say, from the first two people God made. But God remembers what they were like before they fell. And he's determined to bring all of us back to that place. We're kind of like Gomer. The story of Hosea and his wife, Gomer. Uh, she was a prostitute. She preferred to live in adulterous relationships rather than be restored to her true love, her husband. But like Helen of Troy, we, we participated in our own capture. And like Hosea, who goes after Gomer, our king, has come after us in spite of our unfaithfulness. I want you to listen to the names God has given us in scriptures. It says, no longer will they be called deserted, speaking of us. They will be called a holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought after. That's in Isaiah 62. In other words, we are the ones who are fought over, captured. We're supposed to be rescued. We're supposed to be pursued, says God. And it seems remarkable, incredible, too good to be true, that there really is something desirable in us, something that the king of the universe has moved heaven and earth to come and get. You want proof? I, don't, I doubt you could see it in the dark here, so I'm just going to read it to you. But from Revelation chapter 12, catch this. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will shepherd all the nations with an iron staff. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now, if the account of the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, that Pastor Walter read at the beginning of the service, if that provides earth's perspective of what happened on the night Jesus was born. Well, Revelation 12, what I just read you, provides heaven's perspective. What was happening simultaneously? up there. And in the scene in Revelation 12, it's almost beyond our understanding, but the great truth behind that manger scene that we see is that we actually live in parallel worlds. One world consists of oceans and hills and barns and politicians, and the other consists of angels and evil forces, and maybe this entire spiritual realm out there, you know, silent night, holy night, all this calm. Well, when you read Revelation 12, 
It was no silent night. Sure wasn't calm. A war was going on when God said, I'm sending the man to earth, the God man. The devil wanted to do everything he could to stop it because he's the one that stole us from God, wants to keep us, doesn't want God to get us back. As we talked about on Sunday morning, the 11th, the battle is not in heaven anymore, the one before the devil and God, but it was relocated to earth and it's waged over the eternal souls of humankind by way of our hearts. Who can win our hearts? Can God win our hearts? Or does the devil win our hearts? And the behind the world of flesh is an even more deadly enemy we can ever imagine. But this is the world that we live in now, and we're on the front lines of this fierce spiritual war that's to blame for the casualties around us, for literally the death of every human being. I said a couple of weeks ago, you know, in war, people die. It's people that die. We call them casualties. But what happens when any one of us die? Of any cause... Cancer, car wrecks, old age. Those are casualties. And believe it or not, it's a casualty of war. It's a war that started before you and I were born. It's a war between God and his arch rival who wants to take us out. We're casualties of the war. And this is the acid test of our faith that we keep in mind the unseen world as we go about this life. Because there's a whole lot more going on behind the scenes of our lives than most of us have been led to believe. And this is why Jesus came to save us from this evil. We barely comprehend how evil it is. And to rescue, let's say, his Helen of Troy from the captor. And how did he do it? God didn't send in swarms of angels, but a one-man army. And that was the great invasion of God. The baby in the manger was God sneaking in behind enemy lines. And God had to enter into the battle in the flesh, in human flesh. Because the battle is over the flesh. The battle at one time was spirits against spirits. But that was long ago. And it transferred into the realm of the flesh. So he had to enter into the battle as one of us. Max Locato, author, pastor, he describes it this way. He said, he who was boundless became bound, imprisoned in flesh, restricted to weary prone muscles and eyelids. And for more than three decades, his once limitless reach would be limited to the stretch of a human arm. But after being born, he then had to win you over from the enemy. And how exactly did he do that? And what does becoming a human have to do with it? And many people, they get as only, only as far as the manger and they stop there. People may come to church once a year, Christmas time. They consider the sweet story of the baby in the manger, but that's not far enough. Because you actually have to go with Jesus through his life and his ministry and then to a cross. And briefly, it simply goes like this. Jesus was the God-man, fully God, fully human. He had all the limitations and weaknesses of the flesh, but he had all the integrity and character and holiness of God. And therefore, he was able to represent us in the fight against sin that separates our hearts from God. And the enemy threw everything he could on Jesus to get Jesus to cave in just once, because just once is all that's needed to separate any one of us from a holy God. Just cave in once. Sin once, be self-centered once. And it's what we looked at last Sunday. There's this attack that immediately came against the first man and woman God made. And it attacked their identity as image bearers of God. The king and queen of earth. And that led to their fall. And the devil threw the same things at Jesus that he throws at you and I. And his violence, slander, lies, immorality, fame, fortune, you name it. And Jesus didn't once bite. Talk about resilience. And all the way to the cross. And we must mention the cross, even at Christmas time. 
Because we do a great disservice to him and to ourselves if we focus only on how Jesus came instead of why he came. The why is not found at his birth, but at his death. The disciples didn't understand the how until after it was done. He did it on a cross. By prisoner exchange, he offered himself. His life for ours. You might say that was God's thousand ships that he sent to reach us. Because we belong to our captor, called Hasatan, in Hebrew, Satan. And until we escape with our rescuer, we stay his captives. But it's your choice. Do you want to be free? You know, uh, life gets sticky. It's easy to stand up here with things that I've thought out and written out and prayed over and hope God influenced. And for at least a while, forget who I am. But I am needy. And I am hopelessly sinful. And I have done things that have damaged my life and the lives of others. And I have realized, and I realized a long time ago, I need help. I need a rescuer. I've said this before, but I, I need somebody who's not me to save me from me. And you need somebody who's not you to save you from you because you can't do it. And it's amazing what you get stuck in. Even after being a Christian for a long time, even after being a pastor for 30 some odd years, it's amazing what you could fall into. You know why? Because we're still on this darned earth, this damnable planet that still has a devil that wants to take us over. He's a tyrant. And when you see governor, uh, governments and you see a country like America and what it used to be and what it is now, when you see the direction you're going, you tell me there's not a devil. It's not just people who devise the evil they do. And the whole junk that we've gone through over the last couple of years with a virus and the separating and all the junk that we've been through. The conflict around the globe, the things that we actually see happening right now, the threats, not just in America, but in the world, to your freedom, your liberty, you know, your safety, your health, your money, your security. Anybody feel like things are very fragile right now? Like we're all on the verge of losing everything. And somehow you just can't really do anything about it. I hate to tell you, but it was all foretold. And I deeply believe that we are the generation that is talked about in the back of the Bible. That's going to be around when we see the end, the end times come about. You know, there's pages and pages where Hundreds of things were said, foretold about the God-man that would one day come, Jesus. That's who we find out it is when he finally came. Oh, it's Jesus. Born in the manger, lives a perfect life, dies on a Roman cross. And you, hopefully you all know the story here. You understand it. Okay. And there's a generation that actually was alive when... Jesus came and they, they saw it and they looked back and went, oh my gosh. And they look at Jesus' life and they look at what was in the record and they look at Jesus' life and the record and Jesus' life and they go, that's him. And we're alive to see this. Well, you keep turning the page and, and there's all these things talking about what the world's going to look like before Jesus comes back again. He came once, he's coming again.
and you read it, and you look at our world today, and you look at some things, and you look at our world today, and you say, oh my goodness. This can't be. Oh well, yeah, it is. So. I, I've never had a Christmas like this. Where I feel like I'm sitting before people saying, welcome to the final years. I've never said that ever on a Christmas. But I think we're the generation that we're going to close out history. So what are we going to do with our time? I mean, don't try to fight to save your wealth. Sorry, in the digital age, one push of a button in somebody's basement, boop, your stuff is out of your account. Good luck trying to, it's amazing. It's amazing how fragile everything is right now. So I tell you, um, I think this is what you do. Because I could go a long time on this. Um, if you're not in the family of God, if you haven't taken hold of the, of the rescuer, taking you out of captivity, you better take his hand right now because your time is running out to do it. You do it now. Because if you don't belong to God, you believe to Hasatan. You belong to Hasatan, Satan. The destroyer, that's what his name means. Okay, they also call him the devil, it comes from diabolos, another ancient word meaning to throw apart. The word diabolical, like a diabolical scheme to throw apart because the devil throws us apart from God. And you know the story he had. He first got on God's bad side. And then in order to get back at God, he's got this beef with God. He comes after God's kids. He comes after us. And he says, I'm going to steal as many of them as I can. And I'm going to wound you, God, because God loves us. He loves his kids. Like any good dad, he loves his kids. So he did what he did 2,000 years ago. He came himself to the planet and the person of Jesus to win us back. And I tell you, if you, if you don't see this, if you don't see the death of Jesus and the whole concept that he died, he suffered, he paid in the eyes of the, of the Heavenly Father, he paid, he went through the punishment we had coming. He went through that, so we don't have to. If that doesn't do something to your heart and make you say, I want to have a relationship with the one that went through that on my behalf. That's the one that loves me. Well, then you hold on to that hand. And you do it tonight if you haven't already done it. And it's real simple. Even though you don't have all the answers to all your questions, because I'm sure you got questions, but you simply tell them out loud or you tell them right inside your mind. You say, God, I want a relationship with you. Right now, starting tonight. And I'm taking the hand of Jesus right now. The one that came to earth as a baby, died on a cross as a man and died on my behalf to, in payment for my sins. That's where you start. And if that's what you're thinking right now and you're praying for the first time in your life, don't leave. Talk to Pastor Walter, talk to me before you leave, okay? But that's how you begin. So Merry Christmas. With all that. <laughs> so you're going to go home and yeah, cut open the ham. What do we talk about now over at the dinner table? How do we discuss that? I'm going to invite you to come back tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. I got one more message in this series that's very important to tie it in. And it's called Freed to Fight because it's what we do next. God frees us so we can be on assignment with him to free others. And time's running out to do that too. But I do wish you a Merry Christmas. Because I tell you, you are loved. You have been pursued by the God that made you. He loves you to death and he did love you to death. So, Jesus said, um, we are the light of the world. And he said that after saying he was the light of the world. 
And then the idea is that him living in us, as we're his followers, we become his light. And he says, let your light shine. And he says, the light overtakes the darkness. And if there was a time for the followers of Jesus Christ, the army of Jesus, to be light in the darkness, it is now. I've lived 58 years, and there has been no more critical time than right now. The things that even happened over the last few days in the government and around the world, I can't even believe the speed at which things are happening. Time to be the light of the world as ever before. Okay? I'm going to walk this thing out here. And um, a couple of you just, uh, when I bring it near your candle, I want you to tip your candle towards this. I'm not going to tip this to you because I'm going to drop wax on you. Okay? And so I'm going to light yours, and then you just go like this, and the person next to you tips the unlit candle to the lit one. Because if you don't, you'll learn that lesson real good, okay? And you won't make the mistake again. You got it? And then we're going to sing some Christmas carols, okay, with the lights on. It's a great symbol. Jesus came to be the light of the world, and then he gave that to us to do. Are we in? We're up? Okay. No candles for the worship team. You're playing. Come on. Let's stand together.
Christmas Eve. Hopefully see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock.